Bio 100, Chapter 5. Now we're talking about the structure and function of plasma membranes. So we've talked a little bit about plasma membranes and how they're made up and that they exist in all cells, whether it's prokaryotic or eukaryotic. But now we're going to go a little bit further in depth and we'll start with their functions. So the plasma membrane does define the outer border of all cells and organelles. There are some cells, obviously, that we know, like prokaryotic cells and plant cells that also have a cell wall, but cell membranes are in all cells. And they manage what enter and exits the cell as well as what receives external signals, and um, they also initiate cellular responses, and they adhere to neighboring cells. This is often referred to as a fluid mosaic model uh, because it's a mosaic of components. So we have our phospholipids, we have a layer of cholesterol as well in here. We have proteins and carbohydrates um, that give the membrane a fluid character. And there's a good video on this that we'll get to at a later point, um, but you won't be able to see it in this presentation. So you will need to watch the YouTube link that is on La Lima. Okay, so phospholipids. Remember when we went over our macromolecules, these are our lipids or also kind of our, our fats, right? And the main fabric that is composing these cell membranes is an amphiphilic lipid molecule called a phospholipid. So it is made out of a hydrophilic head. Okay, so we've got a glycerol molecule um, up here as well as a phosphate group or sorry, I mixed these up. A glycerol model down here is attached to a phosphate group, which is polar. And remember, polar or hydrophilic, these are our water loving. And then we have a hydrophobic tail. So this is the one that is afraid of or does not want to be near water. And it's made out of nonpolar fatty acid chains. So each fatty acid can either be saturated or unsaturated. Remember, we talked about these um, in our last lecture, but they either have a single carbon to carbon bond or unsaturated has a double bond, which you can see right here. So our hydrophobic tails can be either of those two. Okay, you'll often hear these membranes called phospholipid membranes or phospholipid bilayer. And it's because they've just arranged themselves in a bilayer, bilayer meaning two layers. Um, again, our polar heads are facing outward and our hydrophobic tails are facing inward. So this is what's keeping the water out and the inside and the outside of this membrane is what is our water loving end and is what would be touching either water or aqueous solution like cytosol or you know in the cytoplasm. Okay so we also have proteins as a major component of our membranes and proteins are really important they can do quite a few things they can be transporters receptors enzymes they might even bind or adhere to other cells or proteins and we have a couple different kinds we have integral proteins which are actually integrated completely into the bilayer and then we have peripheral proteins which you see here um, just kind of on the side they're only on the surface of the membrane they don't actually go the whole length or width of the membrane like the integral proteins do. Our integral membrane proteins have one or more regions that are hydrophobic. So it has that hydrophobic amino acid sequence and others that are also hydrophilic. And location and number of regions determines how they arrange within the bilayer. So how many we have and what they really look like can vary between cells. Okay, the third major component that we have are our carbohydrates. These are our oligosaccharide carbohydrates, and they are on the exterior surface of the plasma membrane bound to either proteins forming these glycoproteins here. So it's just a protein with a carbohydrate attached, or they could form a glycolipid, which is just a lipid with a carbohydrate attached. And these guys basically function in cell-to-cell -cell recognition and attachment. Okay, back to our membrane fluidity. So we need our membrane to be flexible, right? We, we need it to be able to move with our cells within the body, but we don't want it so fluid that it can't maintain its structure. So we've got a few different things that influence fluidity. We have 
what kind of phospholipid type that we have. So we either have the saturated fatty acids or the unsaturated fatty acids. So saturated fatty acids pack together more closely than our unsaturated. So the saturated fatty acids make for a more rigid membrane. Temperature can also control it. So cold temperature compresses the molecules and it makes the membrane more rigid, whereas warm temperatures kind of lets them spread out a little bit more and makes it a little bit more fluid. We also have that layer of cholesterol within the fatty acid layer, and that's a fluidity buffer. So it can keep membranes fluid when they're cold and from not getting too fluid when they're hot. So it's kind of a, a good way to keep a healthy balance within the fluidity of the membrane. This is where you can go ahead and watch that video. Um, you can pause it here and watch it if you want to do it that way, or you can watch it afterwards. But please do make sure you watch it. Um, I think it's a good animation, and if it's not something that really speaks to you, there are thousands of other videos on this that you can kind of get an idea of what these membranes have embedded within them and on them, and how they kind of flow through. So all of these plasma membranes are what we call selectively permeable. So it basically lets some things in and doesn't let other things in. And it allows cytosol solutions to differ from our extracellular fluids. For example, all of our cells maintain an imbalance of sodium and potassium ions between our interior and exterior environments. And that allows different things to happen, right? Um, but transport across our selectively permeable membrane can either be passive, which means that we don't require any energy for it. It's just acting on a concentration gradient. Or it can be active, which means that we do need energy. We need what's called ATP, which is the body source of energy. Not just animal bodies. Um, any eukaryotic cell can make ATP. Okay, so first we have passive transport. So this is the simplest type of pass passive transport. It's called diffusion. So diffusion occurs when a substance from an area of really high concentration moves down its concentration gradients. So in membranes, this occurs through the lipid bilayer, and we basically have a net movement um, of the solutions, and once there's equilibrium achieved, then they kind of balance out. But you'll see here we have our lipid bilayer, our plasma membrane, and we have over time what it looks like, right? So we're going from a high concentration to a low concentration. And keep in mind that all organisms, all cells, the main goal is to be in balance, right? We always want to be balanced with our environment. Our cells want to be balanced with the environment. So if we have a bunch of solutes over here, we want to be able to even them out so we get to this thing called net equilibrium, right? Or equilibrium in general. So what will happen is some of these will move through and if it's possible, we want to do it the easiest way we can, and which in this case would be going from high to low concentration, and we would have um, easy passive diffusion. So only the smaller nonpolar molecules like oxygen or CO2, lipid hormones, those are the only kinds of molecules that can really diffuse this way. Really can't do it with large molecules um, because they need energy to help get them across that membrane. But smaller nonpolar molecules, those can pretty easily um, cross the membrane and kind of equal out over here. Okay, so some different factors that affect diffusion rates. Again, we talked about concentration gradients. So the greater the difference you have, if we're going from a high to a low, we can have a faster diffusion. Another thing that affects it is mass of the molecules. So smaller molecules do diffuse more quickly. Temperature also, molecules are moving faster when the temperatures are higher. It's true of um, really in any scenario, right? Solvent density can also affect our diffusion rates. Uh, dehydration would increase the density of the cytoplasm, get a little bit thicker, and that would reduce our diffusion rates. Solubility. So the more nonpolar or lipid soluble materials will diffuse faster as well. So these are ones that would be able to remember our solubility with say a solvent like water, right? Our solutes, like if we're making um, salt water, our salt, our solute will very easily dissolve within our solvent water 
and become a, solu um, a soluble solution, basically. Surface area, increased surface area does speed up diffusion rates as well as the greater the distance, you're going to have a slower rate. So it's an important factor affecting the upper limit of cell size. We want to make sure that if we do have large cells that need to travel across a gradient, the further they are, the more difficult and slower this process is going to be. Also, pressure can affect it. So in some cells, like kidney cells, blood pressure actually forces solution through membranes that help speed up the diffusion rates. Okay, so that was passive diffusion. That's our easy diffusion. We don't need um, any sort of or sorry, um, passive transport via diffusion. We don't need any sort of ATP. Now we're getting into facilitated transport or also known as facilitated diffusion. So facilitated means you've got some help, right? So we're still moving substances down their concentration gradients and we're going from a high to a low concentration. Um, and we can get ions and small polar molecules to diffuse this way, so still not super large and they can either go through channel proteins or carrier proteins. Well, the channel proteins here, um, you'll see we have the extracellular fluid out here and the cytoplasm within the cell over here and we have this protein channel. So the top, bottom, and inner core are composed of hydrophilic amino acids and these attract the ions and or polar molecules. Some are open all the time, some are actually gated, so they only open up when they have the right signal. So it's like if you go up to a gate and you put in your code or you um, flash your pass at it or something, um, that's what these ions do essentially to voltage gated or um, could be proton inhibited. There could be different kinds of gated channels, but importantly, some of them are open, some of them are gated. and uh, some other important examples like aquaporins are specific to water. The muscle cells have gated ion channels like with sodium and potassium that allow muscle contraction when opened. Our carrier proteins are specific to a single substance, so this is kind of like the lock and key. They have to bind to that substance, change the shape, and then carry it to the other side. Okay, so an example is like glucose tr um, transport proteins or glutes or gluts um, is how they're commonly abbreviated, but this can allow movement in either direction as concentration gradients change. So this can be facilitated diffusion or it could be active transport, which we'll talk about in a minute, but that's how carrier proteins work, kind of like the lock and key. You've got to have the right substance um, and protein to go together to be able to carry it through to the other side. So osmosis, how many people have heard of osmosis? I'm sure many of you have. Um, it's a pretty common word I feel like that we hear, especially in some of the basic science classes, but osmosis just means it's diffusion of water across a membrane. So when we're talking about um, aquatic organisms like fish, we're talking about their osmolarity and how they can keep their bodies in balance with their surrounding environment. So with osmosis, our water is always moving from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. Differences in water concentration occur when a solute can't pass through the selectively permeable membrane. So, importantly, when talking about osmosis, we want to talk about how water is going to flow, right? We know it's going to flow from a high to a low gradient, and there's different cases that we can look at um, tonicity. So tonicity basically tells us how an extracellular solution can change the volume of a cell by affecting osmosis. It's usually correlated to the osmolarity of a solution, which is just the total solute concentration. So total solutes meaning both permeable and non-permeable solutes. Permeable and non-permeable meaning whether it's going to dissolve or not, right? And when solutions with different osmolarities are separated by a membrane permeable to water, but not the solute, the water is going to move from the solution with lower osmolarity through the membrane. So the different tonicities that we have are hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic. And those describe the osmolarity of a cell to that of its extracellular fluid. 
Chronicity can be a little bit confusing, so I did also add a video for you to watch on La Lima. Highly recommend doing that. This is also the subject of your class activity or your assignment. Um, so make sure that you understand osmolarity, what tonicity is, how tonicity changes, and what you know the kind of main goal is. And again, the, the goal is essentially equilibrium, right? So we're going to move our solutes across a membrane until we're equal on every side. And when I say equal or equilibrium, equilibrium is never like 50-50, right? It's an equal exchange of ions. So we might have a whole bunch of ions over here and a little bit of ions here, which means that we're going to have all of these ions over here moving towards the lower side. And then once they get to equilibrium, they're still going to be going back and forth, but it's going to be at equilibrium, meaning the same molecules moving this way, you're going to have the same number of molecules moving this way. So you'll still see movement. It doesn't mean that they've stopped and that they're content. It just means that it's going to be the same level of movement so that it keeps it at that happy equilibrium. Okay, our three different tonicities. So we have hypertonic. This is, again, relevant to the extracellular fluid. So a hypertonic solution has extracellular fluid that has a lower osmolarity than the cytosol or the cytoplasm inside the cell. So this means that water is going to leave the cell. So the cell will shrivel up. A good way to kind of describe this, let me um, maybe draw a little bit here. So let's say we have a beaker and I've got my cell here, right? So a hypertonic solution has a whole bunch of stuff out here. This is going to take a really long time for me to mark all this. So let's just pretend like there's a lot more dots ah, out here. And then let's just say we've got two, right? So the ultimate goal is it means I have more solutes out here and less in here, which means I've got a lot of water in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send my water out so that I can get the concentration the same. So my solutes might not necessarily change. I'm not going to always necessarily bring my solutes back in, but I will take the water out so that it kind of shrivels up the cell. That is hypertonic. On the flip side, oops, um, we have hypotonic. So hypotonic And sorry, there's, I'm realizing um, a little bit of a, a typo up here. So this should be hypertonic, but this one should be hypotonic. Go ahead and cross that out. Let's see. Sorry, it's really hard to type. <laughs> or... Um, draw. So this one should be hypo. I know that's really terrible, but this one here, hypotonic, and that's where our extracellular fluid has a higher osmolarity than the cytosol. So water is going to enter the cell. So in this one, essentially what's happening is we have a few solutes outside the cell, and then we have a ton of solutes inside the cell, right? So what's going to happen is we have the water coming in to hopefully equal it out. But as the cell takes on more and more water, it will get lysed, which essentially means that it's going to like blow up, right? And a little bit less dramatics, but it'll blow up. Isotonic, on the other hand, means that our extracellular fluid has the same osmolarity as the cytosol. So water says water does not move. Water does move. It's moving in and out. But again, it's that net equilibrium. So it's moving in and out at the same um, concentration. Okay, so osmoregulating, what do we think osmoregulating means? Osmoregulation is really important for um, things like plants. It's also important for, again, aquatic organisms that might be moving in and out of 
really salty water to maybe less salty water or different temperatures, um, different pHs. For the most part, usually like maybe let's say a fish moving from fresh to salty into brackish water. Brackish meaning that kind of mixture of salt and fresh water. But osmoregulation is just in organisms whose cells have cell walls like plants. Um, and again, aquatic organisms that do not have cell walls can also osmoregulate. But here we're talking about kind of a, a little bit of a different um, scenario with the plants. So with the cell walls, our plants are fungi, bacteria, some protists. These guys prefer hypotonic extracellular solutions. So they prefer this one, right, where we have water coming in and watering the plant a little bit. And then the pressure you get exerted by the plasma membrane against the cell is what we refer to as turgor pressure. So it's critical to organismal growth and functions. We want to make sure that we have an accurate level of turgor pressure here and that we don't go into a hypertonic solution where we get something called plasmolysis. So pretty similar to our other cells that get lysed, like in animal cells, but here we call it plasmolysis and we call this turgor. So it's a turgor pressure and isotonic means again, same flow in and out. So you can see here, here, we don't have enough water on this side and we've got plenty of water on this side. So we have lost turgor pressure over here and you can see that because we're wilting. And over here, our turgor pressure is restored by watering it and you can see our plant looks nice and healthy. Again, we do have um, other organisms that osmoregulate like freshwater protists. An example of this is paramecia or amoebas, and they use contractile vacuoles to pump water out of their cells so that they don't actually burst or plasmolyse um, like the other plants that we were talking about do. Um, this would be, bursting would be the same as lysing. So it's not quite the same terminology between plants and animals. So just be mindful of that. Marine vertebrates also have internal salt concentrations that match their environment. Fishes will excrete diluted urine to get rid of extra H2O or salts. They also have, like sharks have a spe special rectal gland that they'll um, discharge extra salt out of. And then we also have osmoreceptors of brain cells that are monitoring these solute concentrations in our blood and releasing hormones that affect kidney function as well. So osmoregulation occurs across the board in eukaryotes um, and even in some prokaryotes, but when we're talking specifically about turgor pressure, that's for our plant cells. Okay, so all of that was passive transport, right? Um, we had facilitated diffusion as well as simple diffusion. And now we also have active transport. So we've got two different types. We've got primary and secondary. And this just means that we're using it whenever we have an ion or molecule like glucose maybe that's transported through a, a membrane and it's going against the concentration gradient, meaning now we're going from low to high, or it's going against an electrochemical gradient. So meaning like our hydrogen ions um, want to go into a solution that's more positive. So in order to do this, we have to have energy. We have to have ATP. And we've got the two different types, primary and secondary. Primary is where we use ATP to provide the energy. And secondary, we actually use what's called an electrochemical gradient to provide the energy. Okay, electrochemical gradients arise from the combined effects of a concentration gradient and electro, um, sorry, and electrical gradients. An electrical gradient is where the cytoplasm contains more negatively charged ions or molecules and then the extracellular fluid. So you can see here, um, we've got a net charge of positive and a net charge of negative on this side within the cytoplasm. So that's critical for helping with proper cell functioning. So just like with water movement, right, we want to make the number of solutes kind of equal on both sides. Same thing with a net charge, right? So for the most part, we want to be either neutral or maybe slightly negative, depending on what organism we're talking about. And so ions are going to flow potentially back and forth or at least one way until it's at sort of an equilibrium.
We also have this with what's called proton gradients. Um, we won't get too far into this, but you might hear about proton pumps um, throughout the semester. And it's a very similar um, a very similar mechanism to our electrochemical gradients. Proton pumps are pumping protons or are positively charged ions, in this case hydrogen, um, in and out basically and diffusing this hydrogen across the membrane. Okay, so primary active transport is very similar to our diffusions that we were talking about, but now we're going from low to high. And so we're going against the concentration gradient, and so we need some energy. So a good example of this is a potassium, sodium potassium pump, and it'll move three uh, sodiums out and two potassium in, but it will take one ATP to do that. Our secondary, again, uses that electrochemical gradient created by our primary active transport to move against the concentration gradient, and a lot of amino acids and glucose will enter this way. Bulk transport, um, so this is also where we need energy, but some cells, or sometimes our cells need to import or export molecules that are a little bit too large to pass through a transport protein, so that's when we'll use this bulk transport. So importing is endocytosis, importing or in endo. Exporting is called exocytosis. Again, I'm not too worried about you knowing um, really all the differences in this, but just because you might see it throughout the book and our lecture, we'll just touch on it a bit here. But there's three different types of endocytosis of where we're importing. There's phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. And then we also have exocytosis where they're exiting. So phagocytosis is also very commonly called cellular eating, and it's basically where the cell membrane surrounds a particle and engulfs it. So this is, again, kind of Pac-Man-like, like I've said before. Um, pinocytosis, this is our cellular drinking. So the cell membrane actually invaginates and surrounds a small volume of fluid and then pinches it off. And then receptor-mediated, now we're uptaking a specific substance um, by uh, binding to receptors on the external surface of that membrane. So here's phagocytosis. We can see we've got a large particle coming in, and we're basically just going to chomp it and engulf it right here. Phagocytosis, again, that cellular drinking. Um, so we're going to have it come in, and then we're just going to pinch it off and engulf it. And then receptor mediated, so this is kind of like the lock and key, right? They do have to be at the right receptor, but they, as soon as they log in, or log in, as soon as they bind to that receptor, that's when the um, endocytosis can occur. And then again, it'll kind of pinch it off and create a coated vesicle that will go into the cell. So in exocytosis, our vesicles that contain substances will fuse with the plasma membrane, so they'll kind of work their way up here, fuse with this, and then once they're fused, the contents are going to release into the exterior of the cell or into the extracellular fluid. So I know that's kind of quick, especially on the endo and exocytosis. Don't worry too much about that. Just want you to know in general that those do exist and that does happen, and we might touch on them a little bit more detailed later in the semester, but that's kind of a brief overview of plasma membranes, how they're fluid, what they allow in and out of the cell, and how they do so, as well as um, how osmoregularity or osmoregulation and different tonicities kind of affect all of that.